was doing was in an investigation of the so-called diadem of Kulabi of war. Before, before the um, war, jewelry, jewelry and other artifacts went on, the, went on a traveling exhibit, Holly Pittman, who was one of the co-curators of that traveling exhibit, asked me if I knew what the plant uh, imagery, well, you'll see close-ups later, if I knew what the plant imagery was on Huabi's diadem, which was on display in the third floor galleries in the, with the other ore material. And I told her, you know, every time I go up there, I love this stuff, and every time I go up there, I look at that diadem, and I think to myself, what are, what are those objects? Because I, this really didn't look like, every, you know, your first sort is golden grain, except it really doesn't look like golden grain because it's three, it's uh, three dimensional and grain, you know, I'm thinking as an artist and as a botanist, if you were gonna show grain, you would, it would be too ranked, it wouldn't be three dimensional. And the little bush here also just seemed kinda odd. Well, then I noticed that the diadem was exhibited upside down. <laughs> because it is very clear that the, those objects, those, the, the charms, are pendants. Take it away, Richard. So Richard Zettler, a man who needs no introduction, uh, is, is the other co-curator of that traveling exhibit and the current exhibit, and he will explain something about the archaeological background. Oh, here's the, uh, can I get fancy through this? Or this is that. That was so cool, I can see it. That's bad. <laughs> say a little bit about the archaeological context of the so-called diadem from Ur. Um, as we were busy deconstructing other pieces of Ur, we also got busy deconstructing the diadem, as Naomi has told you. The diadem actually comes uh, from the tomb numbered PG-800. This is the tomb belonging to a royal woman named, named Puabi. Uh, we will assume for purposes of our lecture today uh, that the tomb is actually real. I don't believe it is real. I think it is a construct, pieces of two separate royal tombs. This is the Puavi's tomb chamber. The tomb chamber was intact, one of the few tomb chambers within the royal cemetery that was, in fact, intact. Uh, the main burial, you can see it was uh, across one end of the tomb. It was a, she was a woman, approximately 40 years of age, and approximately five feet tall. Um, a wealth of artifacts in the tomb chamber. Uh, the so-called diadem was actually found near her head to the left of the body. And here is what Woolley reports finding. To the left of the beard, near the head, he found the remains of carbonized material that he took to be the remains of a shelf or small table. Resting on this carbonized material, I assume wood, uh, were the elements of what he interpreted as a magnificent diadem. Thousands of very small lapis lazuli beads, and by exact count, it is about uh, 90, about 9,750 small beads. Uh, and uh, I am sure Maud Chance, when she restored it in the 1980s, probably counted them. Aubrey Bodscore, doing her dissertation, counted them. And the totals vary a little bit. Let's say 10,000 small beads. Against a strip of white powdery material, the fibrous texture of which suggested leather. No doubt the background to which the beads were sewn. Against this blue field, small ornaments of gold, which in spite of the decay of the background itself, still kept their order and to some extent their spacing. We have some rough notes in Woolley's uh, catalog and in the field notes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only a very small sketch and no photographs. Um, 
four pairs of animal figures, stags, bearded bulls, gazelles, and rams, small eight-petaled rosettes, ears of wheat, clusters of three pomegranates with their leaves, plants with stems of gold leaf over silver, and with gold lapis and or carnelian pods, palmettes of twisted gold wire, the last found always inverted and so hanging downwards. And with them was a short gold pin with flat head uh, ornamented with the guilloche pattern. And Woolley interpreted this, as I said, as the undoubtedly the queen's spare diadem, fixed to the wind, <laughs> placed along her in the grave. Uh, so that is the report of the discovery. Here is Woolley's original restoration of it. Uh, in a watercolor done by Mary Louise Baker. There was no photograph of the restored diadem in <clears throat> Woolley's report. We have only this, uh, this uh, restored, uh, this painting, the watercolor, presumably uh, done at the time it was on display in the British Museum before coming here. And Woolley gave us precisely what he saw in the ground. He was very good at observing. Uh, and he actually gave us what he saw in the ground, rather than thinking about you know, what might have happened when these artifacts collapsed, or when the backing, or when the, the strings on which the beads were strung collapsed. So you will see these so-called palmettes, or rug beaters, as we used to call them. Uh, the animals against the blue backing, uh, the so-called sheaves of wheat, or stalks of wheat, uh, so this was the diadem as originally restored, and you may, some of you, if you've been around long enough, will remember the galleries as they used to appear, or as they were uh, restored in the early 1980s. Uh, <coughs> Chance very carefully uh, redid the, the so-called diadem, uh, and displayed it uh, around a plexi cylinder uh, in the gallery. So it was restored more or less uh, as a, a diadem. Uh, it is approximately, uh, Woolley says in his field notes, two foot eight inches, or I think approximately 70 centimeters is what he says, or what we say in other publications. So here is the diadem. We took it off of display as we were preparing uh, to send ore on the road. We're looking at it very carefully, and a group of us. Uh, including Naomi, but including also Holly Pittman and Donald Hanson, our late colleague from the Institute of Fine Arts in New York, who were uh, curating the show, looked at it very carefully. And of course, the first thing we noticed is that uh, most of these pieces, um, <clears throat> as Naomi said, they are pendants. They're intended to dangle. They're three-dimensional pendants. Even the animals, that were sewn onto the backing are done in three, three dimensions. So the back is finished and potentially um, would have been visible to viewers. So the first thing we notice is that all these things are glued upright when they should have been dangling. Uh, then we began to, to look more carefully at them. And we were looking in particular uh, at the bales of these individual charms, that is the the holes through which the beads were intended to go that would have attached them. And we noticed that the, there were several different types of bales. Uh, the animals, for example, and one set of the, the so-called uh, pomegranates, what Woolley identified as pomegranates, and Naomi will tell you they are not pomegranates. One set of them consisted of a, the bale consisted of a strip of silver that was raised and then bent over and covered in gold. There is almost, in the Royal Cemetery, in or generally, there is almost nothing of pure gold. It is always a, an amalgam of different things <coughs> in gold foil. Uh, others of the bales uh, actually is just the stalk of the plant, which is bent and then folded back on itself. And still, the, both, both those types of bales were, have, were intended to have two, to be suspended from two strings of beads. Then the, the rug beaters is, a, is just a single uh, coil. So as we began to look at it, we began to think, well, gee, we have, we have things glued, uh, sewn upright onto bead backings that should be dangling. 
we have different types of bales, and we began to question whether this is really a diadem as Woolley, as Woolley reconstructed it. And both Holly Pittman and Donald Hansen uh, very quickly came to the conclusion that this was not a single piece of jewelry, uh, but was really probably an ensemble uh, of, of jewelry, which, as Holly said, she probably had uh, in her jewelry box, it, it sort of just thrown in her jewelry box uh, next to the beer. He said, Holly, that probably tells us more about how you keep your jewelry than how you <laughs> But what it may well have been, and this sort of fibrous white powder might well have been the remains of a leather bag in which this ensemble of jewelry could have uh, would have been kept, uh, perhaps in a box, perhaps just sitting on, on the table. And so you will see initially when Gore went on the road, we kept uh, the beaded backing uh, and the, the piece of material on which uh, the, uh, the beads had been attached, uh, but took off the individual charms and had them grouped uh, on a panel with the bead backing at the bottom. When we put Gore back on display this time, we finally uh, disassembled the bead backing and Holly created a, a series of what may be necklaces, what may be diadems, uh, and attached to and laid the, the uh, charms next to them. So we have now reconstructed this as an ensemble. Uh, there are, is some evidence for other pieces of jewelry like this, for wigs perhaps, for hopefully reconstructs with jewelry on it, but for the moment uh, we and reconstructing it as an ensemble of jewelry. So I turn this back. Is there one more on Okay, so you can, can see these, particularly these bearded bulls are really quite spectacular uh, if you've ever had a chance to see them. And they are actually gold foil over a, a bitumen core. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I realized I forgot to mention, for those of you who don't know that much about the ancient Near East, this stuff dates to about 2500 uh, BC, so just to orient you in time as well as space. Now, in, in the 70s, uh, several, uh, an archaeobotanist, Jane Renfrew, looked at the, some of the actual plant remains that were found at the site, and this is, or you know, in, in in the burials, and this, so there are actual plant remains, not just these images of plants. So the chickpea, six-row barley, wheat, pea, uh, date, and crab apple. Um, there was also uh, red caprobit is a sheep or goat. They're hard to tell apart, and honey is a fish. Okay, so now the as I mentioned, <coughs> what this, as soon as I the the second that I realized that the pendants actually, that they were pendants and hung this way. I know enough about the Near East to know how important date palm was to the people of the ancient, of Mesopotamia, and I also know what the date palm looks like. And so the, the key thing was to realize that the, that the, um, that they were pendants. And in fact, I am fairly certain that if Woolley had real, had thought about it, he probably would have realized it too. And in fact, a colleague, who was interested in this material, I showed him a photograph of, of it, and I said, you know, I figured something interesting out. And he said, what? And I, and I turned the picture upside down. And I said, you know, this stuff, it's dated. And he said, well, that's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> OK, fine. But it, it actually, it is obvious. And so what you can see is the, the day, uh, the date palm is dioecious. And in an ordinary date grove, in order to, um, in order to maximize the fruit production of the particular fruit you want, you want the pollination uh, to occur uh, of a specific variety so that the date breeds true. And the, so the, 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 you only have a couple of trees of flowering male date trees and that will produce the pollen. So this is a, the inflorescence of the date palm that will produce the pollen that will then fertilize the female flowers, and which then produce the dates. And the um, obviously, the dates are going to become ripe long after the flowers have gone away. So 
even though these objects may occur together in jewelry, the, the, the actual flowering of the day palm and the fruiting of the day palm occur months apart. But I think what you can see, what has been always bothering me about the, fact, about the, the identification as, as wheat or barley was that it, the, the pendant doesn't look too ranked. And it's very three-dimensional. And, and in, in ancient Sumerian, actually, the word refers to broom. And you can see how it kind of <coughs> there's a resemblance there. The scale, of course, is completely different of the, for the, the fruiting branch and the flowering branch. But nevertheless, I think you can see that the, um, just the way the dates are arranged on this stem, it doesn't look like grapes, you know, at least in my opinion. It looks, it, you can really see that it looks like dates. And this identification was really satisfying because um, Inanna, who is the queen of heaven associated with uh, the uh, fertility, but also she makes a trip to the underworld and her, she brings jewelry to the underworld. The, the fact that she is so closely associated with dates was very gratifying because now there was a symbolic, you know, it's not just that dates are important to eat, but they're also important symbolically in Mesopotamian religion and their occurrence, the images, their occurrence in a grave that has ritual significance was uh, an interesting observation. Okay, so the next, uh, oh, and one of the things that you should notice uh, how the grapes grow, they, they or grapes, how um, palms <laughs> grow, uh, they, they can grow in a clump and then you clean up the clump and you have a group like that. So the next, the next, thing I started thinking about in terms of plants, because I was, I was, I was you know, like, well, what are these? No. And I, I thought of apple, and then, I, then I, I discounted it. But I was in a meeting, and, and a friend of mine in the audience asked when I presented the dates, and he said, do you, do you think those objects could be apples? And I said, well, let me think about that. And I did think about it. And I decided, not bad, that this, um, this is a pomegranate. You can, it's pretty easy to see why Woolley thought that they were pomegranates, because when we think of pomegranates, you have this, this round thing, and then there's this projection. Now, the fact that it's a bee on the, in the gold, and it's obviously not a bee in reality, is a separate issue. But you know, pomegranates, they have a lot of seeds associated with fertility. They're, in later times, they're very important. They're very, you find them the seeds very rarely in the archaeological record, but that could just be a function of preservation. But the, it doesn't, pomegranate does not seem, even though it's important symbolically in the Levant, it doesn't seem to be that important in Mesopotamia. And, oh, and this is a flower, this is a flower of the pomegranate. But you'll notice just the way the apple grows, it, does, it, it grows in a clump the, in, on short shoots like that. The, um, it, like, like the pomegranate, where the flower is connected, um, there is this a little um, bump. The the leaves are some, the pomegranate leaves are a little bit longer, and the apple leaves are a little bit more ovate. So I think that you can you can make a fabulous argument for date, and I think you can make a pretty good argument for apple. And I, there's no particular reason to think it's pomegranate. And the fact that there is apple in the in the tomb, I mean, actual apple, dried apples on a string, is further indication that they knew about apples, even though apples are not the, the climate in Mesopotamia is not ideal for apples. Nevertheless, this is something they knew about. And in, this, in texts written, that are written down somewhat later, uh, apple also is associated with Inanna, as well as her consort Dumuzi. So again, to have apple as a symbolic uh, participant in the grave ritual is not, not only not a problem, but is, is, is satisfying. So the, the next problem that, that I started thinking about, you know, like, who worries about the damn animals? You know, the hell with the animals. But anyway, <laughs> so the, so the, 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 the so-called rug beaters, I mean, like, it was like this total mystery. It's like, and I didn't know what to do with that. And then a few years ago, I had a brilliant idea, and, I, and again, I was really, I was on a roll, and, and, and I, I didn't, it's interesting, I had not heard until today, or yesterday when I was 
talking to Richard, that Woolley called that object a palmette. And I didn't realize that, but independently, the thought crossed my mind, thinking about what I know about um, the, the uh, art history of the ancient Near East, which, trust me, is not that much. But uh, this relief, which is on display in the British Museum, is, it's in all the history, art history books. It's really famous. It dates to about 739 BC, something like that. And this is a picture of Lynn Mikowski was kind enough to take a photograph of it for me when she was in London a few months ago. And I was thinking, well, you know, the palms grow, they, they, they put out little suckers, they have little babies, and you know, you know, maybe that could represent a palm grove. And then Holly Pittman pointed out, and I read subsequently that Edith Parada had, had uh, or wait, had said that maybe this Assyrian relief that this actually could represent a, a palm grove and its water, maybe irrigation connect. So those were two possibilities that crossed my mind. And I was getting ready to publish this. And I talked to um, Irene Winter, who's an art historian, and I asked her if she knew if, what she thought of it as an idea and if she had any other information that she could you know, help me out with. And she said, like, on a, on a formally, she didn't really, you know, it was interesting. But if I was going to make an art historical argument, I was really going to have to connect the 2500 <coughs> BC jewelry with the 730 BC uh, bar relief. And I, and I thought to myself, well, gee, you're the art historian. If you don't know anything, maybe that means it doesn't exist. And so I did a sort of cursory, you know, cursory search. And, discovered that th this motif, which is called the Assyrian sacred tree motif, really is restricted. It, it starts, it's Assyrian. And so the, the, although it occurs on cylinder seals and other objects, it really does seem to be, it doesn't go earlier than the 8th century. And so then I started, I, I rethought it again and decided, well, maybe I won't publish that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've, going back to basics, okay, it's wire. So the first thought is, like, could it be just a design in wire? And I didn't think that was likely because m at most of the images and the decoration in, in, of Mesopotamia, it really does seem to be uh, not abstract. I mean, like, or I shouldn't say not, not it's, it's objective. It, it, it seems to be representational of something. And there might be a little bit of um, uh, abstraction, but it's still, the, it's representing, it's not just a design. And, so the, the idea that it's just a design or that, that it's representing itself, representing wire, didn't make that much sense to me. Now, I'd already considered the possibility of water when I was thinking about the, the palm possibility. And the, the problem with the water is that there's, in ancient Mesopotamia, that's not how they show water. The water, this is like, this is an early sign for water. And, the, and, and in, later, in later times as well, there's a kind of, they'll show water as undulating parallel lines. So water wasn't satisfying. And also water doesn't, you know, doesn't loop around. I mean, water flows in one, it's unidirectional. So water didn't make a whole lot of sense. Then I can say, well, roads, the, we know they had roads. Um, and this is a later, a later tablet that actually is a map, but the lines are actually showing canals, not roads. And so again, the Mesopotamians, as important as Rhodes would have been to them, they don't really seem to have shown it very much, and um, they don't talk about Rhodes that much. So, and Rhodes, also like water, Rhodes tend to go in a direction and, or branch out. They don't tend to curl back on themselves. So then I started thinking, well, you know, what else is linear? So they all snake, you know. Um, snake would be a possibility, except that they do show snakes. And snakes are important, you know, so that's, you know, that's good from a symbolic perspective. So snakes are important. The trouble is that the way they show snakes is not the way the, the so-called rug beaters uh, look. So, so, and then I started thinking, well, rope, like rope is a linear thing and rope can curl around. And could it be rope? And then as soon as I started <coughs> thinking about the possibility of the, the so-called rug beater representing rope, uh, I realized that I had seen in Turkey and I had seen in um, Syria 
when people mil milking sheep and milking sheep, that not so much, not necessarily in the pattern. I will pass this around. <laughs> if you, uh, this is a, an enlargement of the, the design that you would see if you go up to the galleries. That they may, people may not rope the animals um, using that exact uh, uh, district, the way, uh, arrangement of the rope. And this is a, a photo I got off the internet that shows exactly what um, I'm talking about. Uh, here's a little models. I didn't know I was going to be able to get on Creative Commons a free one. So in the meantime, uh, Kate, Kate Moore uh, found these on eBay and then we colored them up to make them for verisimilitude. Um, but I, I really think that you can make a, a good argument that the, the wire is representing rope. The rope is representing a, a milking flock. And the beauty of that is that by itself, to me, is pretty interesting. But because Dumuzi, Inanna's consort, is Dumuzi the shepherd, I think you can make a, it, a status, a closure of here you have in this burial some, a representation of a really important <laughs> stories. That are, not, that are known in Mesopotamia and personages in the form of these uh, Nana and Dumuzi who are really important. Um, do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if, if, if I counted correctly, because it was rather yeah. quickly, but the rough beaters that uh, are on this plane, yeah. are they the same to have nine? They're very, they're, I went up, I checked. They're, they like, they're, they're not, they're a little, most of them are nine. There's one that's broken, there's one at 11, I think. Uh -huh. So they're not, they're not, okay. um, they're not 100% the same. It's not a counting thing. No, no. So I think that's it for. Yeah. Okay. So that that was that was it for the for the diadem. But um, the the other thing I want to talk about really briefly is the because there are other plant there are, there is other plant imagery in that comes from Kuabi's uh, grave and. Well, uh, there's the Kalabi herself was all decked out in, in this objet, and then she, uh, how many how many dead attendants were there? Uh, there are three in the tomb chamber and at least eleven in the so-called death chamber. Oh, okay, so there was also sadly human sacrifice. I mean, certainly sad, sadly for the sacrifices, and um, <laughs> and so this is the, the the they had they had jewelry too but it wasn't quite as elaborate as Kulabi's uh, headdress. Now, uh, I should have passed this, I forgot to pass this around. Uh, you should, when I pass it around, you should, I'm not sure how well uh, pasted these are, so you know, keep it horizontal. This is apple leaf that, that Kate Moore collected for me, and this is some, some beach. And one of the things that I can tell you that the woolly, Said that he thought that these the broad leaves these he thought they were beech because the the general shape of beech you know here this is also you could see more beech uh, anyway the the veins on beech go right out to they're very straight parallel and they go right out to the edge of the leaf and that's the, so that's the case for. The, these leaves. It's also the case for the so-called apple, you know, what I'm calling the apple or pomegranate or whatever you think it is. That's how they did the leaves with uh, parallel veins that go straight, that go out to the edge of the to the of the leaf. And so he thought that they were beech. Well, beech is a cooler climate tree, with maybe from the Pontic region, from from Anatolia, and so you have a foreign princess. Okay, it didn't really make a lot of sense because also why would why would people from Mes artisans in Mesopotamia, they wouldn't, when would they ever see a beech leaf? Because a beech leaf is not an item of commerce. Even beech nuts are, were probably not items of commerce. And basically, most people since, except for the Woolley's first initial thought that, they're, that they were, might be um, uh, beech, pretty much everybody thinks that they're poplar. I mean, it really, poplar is, is for, for the only thing to me that really makes sense because poplar grows in Mesopotamia. It's known in Mesopotamia. It's mentioned in texts. 
the wood is found. I mean, it's a completely, it's completely non-problematic to call it poplar. And then these longer leaves that, that, that occur in triplets, they're three separate leaves, but that occur in triplets, are, um, they, they look very similar to willow, which is also a nice, is convenient, because willow and poplar, they both grow along the Euphrates. And, you know, they're, uh, willow is not as important in the text, but it, it, but it still occurs in text. And it would make sense that you would have willow, associate willow and poplar. So this is the willow and two different kinds of poplar. And um, then in, in 2008, the, the, several people wrote an article that they, that they actually thought that, that what, what everybody thinks is poplar, they said it was a pipal leaf. And the pipal tree grows in the Indus Valley. And that would, what, why would you even think of Indus Valley? Oh, it was a print, you know, Puabi was an Indus Valley princess, and so this is a, you know, from home, and they brought the diadem with them, whatever. In my opinion, I just, for the record, I don't think it makes sense. They were making the argument that, see these, what's known in the trade as a, an acuminate tip, which is a very attenuated tip of the leaf, that, the, that there are all these beads that are attached to these tips of the leaves, and that therefore, uh, the, the beads were not really relevant, that the shape of the leaf was, with this long tip, was just like a pipal leaf. And my argument is just, well, the beads, they put beads on the end of the apples. They put beads on the end of the willow leaf. They put beads on the end of the so-called poplar leaves. The beads are there either as decoration, they might be functional to, because the leaves are really thin, maybe that little extra weight, you know, keeps them weighed down. But there's no particular reason to think that the long tip, which isn't even as long as a bee you know, the, the tip isn't that long. There's no particular reason, in my opinion, to think that the so-called poplar leaves are bee um, So I think that's it. But I have so much more to say, and I'm happy and I'm to answer questions. And um, I think Richard also would answer the questions. Are there jagged edges on the gold poplar leaves? No, no, they're, they're, oh, that's, okay. Right, right, okay. So one of the things, one of the things to think about, why we even have a prayer of understanding antiquity is because we're all human, like they were human too. And people, the, and perception of nature is part of our equipment as human beings. And the, the most, the, the word that the ethnobotanists use is salient, saliency. What's the first thing you see about a leaf? The first thing you see about a leaf is the shape. And I think that what these ancient people were looking at was the shape. The venation is important when you're trying to identify a leaf, and you might show that. And similarly, the, the, whether the edge is dentate, whether, there are, whether it's wavy, the wavy margin, the margin of the leaf is important too. I think in this particular case, they, they, they were not handcrafting individual leaves. And I think it really, they were mass produced. And the single most important thing is the shape. They were just trying to give the impression of the shape. So, but, but they are indeed, it's completely smooth margin. And that would support the beach view. And, but um, the poplar, the willow, the apple all have a uh, little bit of serration or two. Yes. I have a new idea about the beads on the tips. All right. I'm thinking about the function of those beads as drip tips and having the beads be drops of water after a rain. Something to think about. After the sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> I think, actually, in regard to beech leaves, and Philip may know better than I, when Woolley was excavating in the 20s, it was a current thought that the Sumerians had come from the mountains down uh -huh. into the floodplain, and I think that's where he why, might, he, he, why he might that have been, was certainly why he might his been, mind. Been, there, there's even darker waters, because, of course, one of the, one of the sort of things for finding an Indo-European home or an Aryan homeland, as they would have said at the time, was the fact that there's common words for the beach in a lot of uh, Indo-European languages, and, and there is a there is a slightly uh, dodgy uh, 1920s, 1930s theory that the Sumerians were, of course, Aryan, which is of course why they are civilized. And those surrounding them are not civilized. So I, I 
I think, I think <coughs> it could well be that the beach was resonating with, with Woolley for, you know, for reasons not entirely due to what he was looking at in the tombs. <laughs> huh. um, the, um, another thing that's interesting, or that I, I actually I forgot to mention with regard to the, the palm tree, and that I should have thought of initially, was the, 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 the rope also is upside down, and you would never show a tree. As, I mean, that's an, another region against it that the palm would be, that it hangs, it hangs upside down. Yes? Um, I was going through the galleries recently, I was with my mom, and she wanted to know the animal symbols, the, the horned sort of, I just wanted to know if they were reindeers, which I said doesn't make any sense for where we are. And, but um, are they, can I go back and tell her that they are cattle? Or no, no, the four animals, and this, I had a lot of discussion, like Kate Moore and I, we, she's a, a zooarchaeologist, so we went, we, we spent half an hour or so, like, just looking at the, the various objects. Correct me if I misstate anything. Um, okay, first she noticed, which apparently others had too, but I certainly had never noticed, that the bull isn't really a bull, because the bull has a mask, that the beard, Bulls don't have beards. <laughs> and, and then if you look closely, you can see in another object in the gallery and, and in pictures and books and stuff that, that the sun god is sometimes represented as a bearded bull, but with a mask. And, and so that there's a rope actually across his snap. So that's interesting. The, um, one of the questions that I had for Kate was, wouldn't it be OK? Um, we have the domesticated, the apples and the, and maybe it's like wild and, wild and domesticated. Well, three, the, the animals, there's a st the stag, not the reindeer. So the stag, the, um, the bull, the gazelle, the ram, they all have horns, right? So they're all, so that's male, but that's interesting. But what about, are they all wild? And it's like, no, she, like Kate said, there is no, that, there is no way that the ram could be representing a wild animal. These people, they knew their animals. I mean, like, they're, everything's, they're, they're, the, the sweetness of the expression on the gazelle and his face. I mean, like, they, if they wanted to show something, they, they could do it. I mean, if they wanted to be realistic. And the fact, the fact that three of the four types of animals have horns that they weren't, they weren't making a compact, they weren't doing something abstract, they could have projections, they weren't about, worried about things breaking off. The ram has the horns are really close to the head and do not project out at all. And Kate assures me that there is no way that that could be a wild ram. Just forget that. So if you're looking for, for uh, dichotomies, if you're looking for uh, you know, opposition, wild, wild uh, and domesticated, you're not going to get it. In, or plants, you know, plants and animals, yes, but who's to say, but I'm not saying that they make a dichotomy. The, the point might be reinforced, though, that there are two species of deer that are native to the um, Near East, and they would have been familiar, and it's a, it's a relatively effective representation of that wild, totally undomesticatable animal. Yeah? Nami, would you please go back to the previous slide with uh, the, the handcuffs? Uh, I go before. Uh, before. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, we can stop here. You know, you see, yeah, I want to have a ram next to it. Yeah, that's good. You know, see, you see that, you see that the one, you said the rope shape thing, you know, okay. Then you see that the two, is it two rams right on above yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, these rams. So I think what's the relationship between these and the dumb? And also, they have, here have to have a horn, so those have, have the rams. So what's the relationship? You think this one just using to, to milk this is? Well, remember, of course, a ram is male, and therefore you're not going to milk. So that's what I'm saying. <laughs> any of the female one look like they're horns, they're all kind of well, male. The animals, are, the animals that are represented, are they're all male. OK. But then I'm saying, do you think that when you study this, well, do you think that you see, if you think of a rope is for the, have the sheep in control right. to milk them? Yeah. Do you think any of these animals may be part of this design? Oh. Why they have these animals no, I don't, right close to this wall? But you, you could well, you have to remember that this this is the so diadem by is, us. It's, it's, it's not a diadem. It's I mean, it's not by us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. it's not an object. So so the 
like you can talk about a general association. I, I mean, and I do think it's fair to say that these objects, whether it was one object or multiple objects, they're found together. And I think they represent this, a, 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 an assemblage and yeah. that there is a relationship. And the thing with the, with the, what I'm calling the rope, I think Dumuzi also is associated. Dumuzi goes to the underworld, like one of the Dumuzi stories, which again is much later. I mean, the stories are written down, this I learned from Philip, like the eight, <laughs> about 18, I guess, 1800 BC. So the stories are quite, a, you know, are hundreds of years, centuries after the representations in the tomb, but I think you can you can use you can use this material to bring some of those stories back. I mean, like there's they kind of or meet in the middle. And Dumuzi, being a shepherd, if if the he went to the underworld and he actually died in the underworld, and you can make an argument that the rope is is showing an absence of milk or an you know like that in in death. I don't think you know. The sheep are gone. The sheep, yeah, the sheep are, the sheep are, oh, right? Oh, okay. you, maybe you could make that, you could make that argument. My own feeling of the matter is that A, I don't know, but my own, my projection is that it's actually just representing, it's, it's just a representation of a milking flock rather than, ha rather than, than making multiple, like they did multiple leaves, well they didn't want to make a lot of little, you know, mm -hmm. they didn't want to make, Images of a lot of little sheep, and so this was a shorthand way of but maybe indicating. But they really that. wanted to show the sheep gone. Yeah, but that's but that is the thought has. It's possible. I that, don't know what that means. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a tomb, you know. Like it's, 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 sort of, it's in the underworld. There's not a lot of food in the underworld, you know. Like so. We find all of these male ones, have not, and find any female ones. All right. So, yeah. Who are these figures? How do the flowers fit? <laughs> Oh, the rosettes. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. my theory. My theory of the rosettes, which I think is, I have to find out who else says that because, but I thought of it on my own. If you look again, if you look at the, if you go back to the early writing, which predates um, the tomb, the and and later writing with cuneiform, the, the star, a star, right, is done with like two crosses. The easiest, if you want to do a really. We don't have a if you want to do a really quick, if you just want to show a star Actually, or a rosette, side on this side. Yeah. you just go, you know, lift your, no, like that. And it's the easiest way to do it. I think that because this, the star sign is on, it means heaven, or it's, it's also used in writing to mean God. And it seems, uh, the, the art historians think it's associated with Inanna. I think that it's referencing a flower. It looks like a flower, right? But at the same time that it's a flower, and also, it is also representing a star, and I think it's a multi. I think it's basically they had visual. They used visual puns, and I. Um, so I, it might be an association. It might be a reference to Inanna, is a thought. But that so and not every single rosette in the ancient Near East is is eight has eight um, like petals or whatever. I've, I know of a couple that have ten, but they're, I think it's just kind of random. And the artist, you know, like. It doesn't have, eight is not significant. Eight is really just a function of that's how they do it. Um, cause it but there are also the rosettes in the, in the diadem. Yeah, the diadem has, has there rosettes. There are a series of small rosettes, mm -hmm. and actually of the beads, about 9,960 <laughs> of them are lapis, but there is a, small, a number of gold ones as well. And if you see what we've done up in the galleries is to take those rosettes and create a small sort of fillet uh, of gold rosettes that might have been around the, the forehead. I, I don't know whether that's what it is, but it's a guess. Oh. Didn't they also use rosettes on some of their uh, non-jewelry uh, items? Yeah. For example, the, the tumbler. The tumbler also. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Out. Yeah. <laughs> the tum the tumbler the well and, and the small gold boat shaped bowl yeah. has a rosette on the bottom. Mm -hmm. The ram in the thicket has rosettes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Lynn? Well, I just wanted to point out that the scholarship is great, but somebody has to make it work for you guys. And the person who we strung the 90,000 <laughs> <laughs> is Vicki Chisholm sitting right up there. <laughs>
Okay, um, one of, a friend of mine pointed out, and I, I didn't know this, but she pointed out that if, when dates ripen, they ripen from the bottom up, and so this could actually represent the first, ripe, the first ripening of the dates. Hmm. Or else it's just decorative. I mean, like those are, you know. But I, mean, but I like the idea, you know, I, when, as soon as she said that, I was like, oh, that makes sense. You want to talk about lapis? What about it? About the, the, the connection with the other ideas on the other one. Oh, well, the, the Holly pointed out that there's the, that lapis, uh, Inanna goes to, Inanna goes to the, when she goes to the underworld, she, she brings a lot of lapis beads with her, further supporting the Inanna, the Inanna de Musi uh, <coughs> connection. What's the bearded bull? <laughs> it looks like they really did actually tie a physically tie a beard onto these animals. Does it say anything about them doing that in text? <laughs> well, apart from the fact that, that Utsu is described as being, you know, the one with the lapis beard, yeah. um, nothing springs to mind. I mean, are there any animals that would look like a bull with a beard attached to it that possibly existed thousands of years ago? And but I mean, they, no they actually show the, 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 the string. They show the, rope the string. Across and, the you know, I've thought and thought about this. You know, there are bearded goats. And so that's where they could have gotten, I mean, it just, it's, it's <laughs> totally crack brain from my perspective as a zoologist. And it has, for me, it has to be about the domination of the animal. That we have this long tradition of probably 5,000 years before this time of people doing things to show how impressive they are that they are able to dominate and worship these male cattle. And so here's one that's so, I mean, it's just, we have turned this huge, powerful, scary animal into such a wuss that we can make them wear a Halloween costume. <laughs> 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 Bulls or are those wild bulls? I mean, can you could one tell them? I can only assume because they're wearing a costume, they're dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you could have the idea. I mean, the thing is, is you have the you have the, uh, the figure the, of the, the bearded the warrior who fights who fights bulls. I wonder whether it's a combination of it's a kind of a shorthand for for that that sort of scene of the of the bearded warrior fighting with. with two wild animals, which can be, I think, two wild bulls. The horns on these guys are ambiguous in terms of are they wild or are they domestic. The, there's some other images of the, 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 the masked bull upstairs where they're clearly domestic. So I don't know, but I would like to hear more about the bull warrior. I think that would, would uh, reward some consideration. But the other thing is that these, in addition to having a beard, they also have a hairy chest, which is also not very uh, domestic-like. Sorry, sorry, Naomi. They have a hairy chest. It's not just, they don't just have a beard. The beard is clearly fake, but the chest hair does not appear to be fake. <laughs> How do we know that? How do we know that? Well, it's not tied onto the rope. <laughs> I think the take home, in terms of the decoding, like, the, 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 I mean, it's 1.30, and in terms of the, the take home message is that even that observation of nature is something, the connection, the, the way you can figure some of this stuff out is understanding that these people, the ancient people, were, were also looking at the natural world, and we have the same mental capacity to look at the natural world. But they were living in a different world and they used a different system. So you just have to, you know, I have to say, I would never have figured out the rope if I hadn't already been thinking about these other things. And so that the, you really you go from, the dates are really obvious. The apple is pretty good. And then you start thinking, oh, this is symbolic. What is it, what is being represented? And, and then you think of the ethnoarchaeology that, or that, you know, the ethnographic um, analogies that can be made. And so you pull together a lot of information from, not, you know, current observation, what we know of from the text, what we know from ancient art. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's really a lot to think about. Did you mention the gazelles? And the no, and I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Inanna had to give something to seven different gatekeepers, right? What if, 
Yeah, what if this was a bag of seven objects? Oh, well, there's that an idea. Intended to give for in the, in the afterlife from Kuabi to different mm -hmm. Could be. And you know, she had a, a bag at her right side, mm -hmm. a, a leather bag full of uh, headdresses that will be associated with males. Uh -huh. These so called breeds. Mm -hmm. So she has a bag there. And, and the bag. They're, they're giving these are gifts to, mm -hmm. to underworld deities, I think. Mm -hmm. Some of it, anyway. Yeah. Go to these before the underworld. You've got a bribe, everybody. Thank <laughs> 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 you.